Welcome back everybody to Physics of Aviation. Dr. Jeff Sanders, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Physics Department, Physical Sciences Department. Today our topic is collisions, momentum, impulse, and all the safety aspects involved. Uh, last time we left off by having an engine failure, managing our kinetic and potential energy, staying at best glide speed while we dissipated all that energy, and finding our field, landing properly with the minimum controllable airspeed, getting that kinetic energy down as low as possible. So now what happens? Now we're going to try to make sure we don't have a collision and we're going to manage our momentum and impulse to improve safety. So a quick reference to the airplane flying handbook. Hopefully everyone has read chapter 17 twice, future flight instructors and pilots. One thing they talk about here is looking at what's at the end of the field you choose. Do you have a wheat field or a corn field or do you have barns and oak trees? If we look here, this pilot is going to try to land in this great field, but notice there's barns and oak trees at the end. This pilot did not have a field to land in, so instead of landing on the ground and slamming into the oak trees, a good way might be to dissipate energy and this impulse and change momentum in the tops of the trees. So what is the FAA talking about here and what's the underlying physics? And we'll do some calculations. So let's go back to Physics 103 class and do the example that everybody does. I steal this from Dr. Paul Hewitt in his famous conceptual physics series where he does a non-trigonometry version of physics. And we take our Volkswagen with mass m traveling at some speed v and it has a momentum mv. Momentum from physics class is mass times velocity. A more massive object has more momentum. If it's traveling faster, it has even a higher momentum. If it's sitting still at rest, even if it's massive, it has zero momentum. All these concepts from physics. And in experiment A, we slam into a brick wall. So we have a very short time of the collision, and after the collision, our VW is crunched like this. And it has a small time interval. Delta T is very small. So we think back to physics and Newton's laws from the PHAC, the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, or physics class that says F equals MA. Some force equals mass times acceleration. These are vector quantities. We can just think of the magnitudes. And acceleration is change in velocity per time. So if you simply take the outsides of these equations uh, and rearrange, we get force times delta time, or force times time interval, equals, whoops, I forgot a mass here, m is m delta v. Aha, this quantity has a new name in physics called impulse. The force times the time interval, and this quantity is our momentum. And since mass is a constant, we can make this delta mv, and we have impulse equals change in momentum. Okay, so what do we want to compare now? Now we compare the same VW bug traveling at the same speed, V, but now the driver goes for a stack of hay. And the driver still comes to rest so we're going from momentum mv to momentum zero in both cases. So the change in momentum is the same in both cases. Therefore, the total impulse must be the same. However, here the variable that changes is the time. Our delta t here is a much larger time. Aha, what must be true then in order to keep these total impulse the same in both cases? The force must be much lower. So we have a much more smaller force on impact, a much huger force on impact here. And this concept was not understood in the 1950s. Uh, 1957 Chevy was very rigid metal, huge, massive, and they thought this would protect the passengers. And they were exactly wrong. That would cause a collision with a small time interval, and passengers would get thrown into the dash and into the wheel and into the, um, into the glass with a huge force. If you can extend the time interval, you have a much lower force for the same change in momentum. So that's exactly what the FAA is talking about here. 
If you can find the wheat field or the corn field or slow down, lengthen that time of collision for a same given kinetic energy and given momentum, you can save lives. So let's look at some calculations now. Let's take a force on a 200 pound pilot and we're gonna use um, the speeds that we used in our last example when the pilot does this incorrectly and has a tailwind. And if you look back at video number four, we calculated um, 44 knots airspeed with a 20 knot tailwind. This is airspeed and tailwind. That gave us a 64 knot ground speed, which we calculated as 33.9 meter per second. So our ground speed is 64 knots, 33.9 meter per second. And so we're gonna take our airplane now and we're gonna land with this ground speed. The NTSB reports and uh, Department, of Motor Department of Motor Vehicles, DMV reports for a few states I looked up said the average time of a collision is eight one hundredths of a second. What does this mean? This means from the time the car or the airplane first strikes the barn or the brick wall or the tree until the time everything crunches and comes to rest. And this is what engineers have done since the 1957 Chevy. Modern vehicles have what's called a crumple zone and cause it to crumple with a larger amount of time which reduces the force of that collision. Okay, so let's do some calculations now. F delta T is our impulse. Delta MV is our momentum. So we're gonna rearrange and find this force. F1 for the pilot that has this tailwind and incorrectly lands with a large kinetic energy, large momentum. So let's say delta MV over delta T. The mass of our person, we need to calculate this. So let me go back up here into the margin. 200 pounds divided by 2.2 pounds in one kilogram gives us 90.9 kilograms. So we can plug this in now. We have a constant mass, 90.9 kilograms. As this pilot gets thrown into the glass or into the yoke, our velocity is a change in velocity, final minus initial. Our final velocity is zero because we're coming to rest either in a brick wall or a stack of hay, whatever it is that causes us to, um, to hit this hard and come to stop in this short amount of time. 33.9 meter per second over our delta T of 0.08 seconds. So I'll pause the video now and crunch some numbers. And when we do this, we end up getting 11,700 newtons or 11, oh, excuse me, 38.5, I was looking ahead of my notes, 38.5 kilonewtons of force. So this is the force throwing you into the yoke. The, the, pass, the pilot's in here, we know from Newton's first law of inertia, object in motion tends to stay in motion in a straight line at a steady speed, so as the plane comes to rest quickly, the pilot and passengers continue to move forward until they get stopped by the yoke, sometimes with fatal results. So now we do the next one, number two, for the pilot that lands with the proper headwind. And this calculation we already did in um, video number four or three, we had 44 knots airspeed, 20 knots wind. So we subtract the two now and that gives us a ground speed of only 24 knots over the ground as you land. Well, if you remember from our previous video or you can reconvert now, pause the video and convert this to meters per second, we end up getting 10.3 meters per second. And we plug into the same type of calculation, F2, is delta MV, the change in momentum over this time interval. So we have 90.9 kilograms, zero minus 10.3 meter per second. This would be a negative number uh, because it's forces in the, in the opposite direction. You're getting thrust forward, but then there's a force in the other direction on you, you know, force of your body on the, on the glass or the glass on your body depending which way you define as positive and negative. That's fine, those are details. We want the main concept here. 0.08 seconds, and you crunch these numbers and you get an answer of 38.5 kilonewtons. Oops, excuse me, I'm looking at my notes wrong again, sorry. 11.7 kilonewtons. 
So about one fourth of the force on your body. Okay, this can also save lives. So again, extremely important to have a, not a fast ground speed, but a slow ground speed. How do you do that? By making sure you pick the field and land into the wind. Now the other variable that we'll do in our next video clip here, we can tweak this 0.08 seconds. And we need to do some research and look at some NTSB reports, because this is an average. Um, your homework is to look up some NTSB reports and find some range, or look at DMV articles, or do some physics from scratch. This might be slightly longer, it might be slightly shorter, but definitely if you hit the wheat field or the corn field, you can extend this time quite a bit. If you run into the oak trees or the barn or the brick wall, this might even be a smaller amount of time. So that can help you reduce that force extremely on the passengers. So some notes on this concept relative to uh, the Airplane Flying Handbook and other FA publications. They talk about wheat fields, uh, corn fields, you know, to extend that time, which will reduce the force. They also talk about some reports where um, pilots have intentionally sheared the wings. What does this mean? Shear, we know about this from wind shear, where you have different velocities and directions at different heights of wind. In physics and mechanical engineering, we say if two surfaces are moving like this, we have shear, or like this is torsional shear. So this means your wing could have been sheared off as the pilot intentionally took the fuselage between two trees to knock the wings off on purpose, but to save the lives of the people. That's an important concept that the FAA says is to save the passengers, don't necessarily try to save the aircraft. That reduced the kinetic energy quite a bit. So we got some figures here to show you. Um, another one is the treetops. Maybe you're out in a very forested area, you're flying in a remote region, and you don't have a farmer's field in which to land. Well, maybe you find a small clearing, but it's not enough distance to stop, and you want to hit the clearing, but then you might hit the bases of the trees and have a catastrophic fatality because of this idea of the time interval being way too short when you hit the tree bases. Well, they say, go for the treetops. It's much more risky than a wheat field and a nice farmer's field, but it's better than hitting the tree trunks. You're gonna dissipate that energy, and the accident show, or the research shows that people live when they dissipate that energy in the treetops.